Father Lord, but I need the Lord. I just got a phone call from my son and he made it home. But we went up to do, uh, for services, he, he uh, buried his little one and unborn. And you know, what? the first time in my life, that's something that I, I never ever thought would happen to me or my family, but we went back and he took it pretty hard. And so he just called me and said he's home, and so that made me feel really good. Now I have a daughter who might get deployed to Iraq. She's from the Dine Nation. My Kakojas are in the uh, Navajo Immersion Program. They're doing very well, not only with their language, but also academically. So it'd be good to go visit that, and I've thought about it, and to uh, go see how they're doing that the Diné, the Navajo people. I've been involved in teaching now a good 30 years. And one of the things that I had to do in my life was, is to sober up. So I've been walking the red road for close to 29 years now I've been sober. Atta. You know, it never goes away, you know, that urge. Especially, uh, watching football and they bring on those beer commercials. Ooh, le. See that foam coming down the glass. Holy Christ, my mouth starts saliva, salivating, they say. I can still taste it. But over the years, I learned that children can teach you things that you never thought were possible. They can take you to levels that only, I guess, a teacher would uh, really appreciate. I was working in Montana teaching Dakota, working with Dakota. And before I forget, I hope everybody has a text. All right, you want to go get them a text. Now, I'm going to ask you to not to walk off with these. These are my texts. And I'll make an announcement before we end. But anyway, some are in L and some are in D. And I'm working on N. So some say Lakota, same, some say Dakota, same Nakota. Me, I say Mikota. Oh. <laughs> Ethnocentric there. A little ego. They were honoring a recipient of an award for $18,000, a trip to Hawaii. Oh man, Montana sure does it right. They have two awards, one for the east side and one for the west side of Montana. And being a new staff member, they come and ask me to sing for this individual who was receiving this award. Her husband's from Standing Rock, she's a baker. And so I went and sang, I sang a positive thinking song that I composed for my aunt. And uh, after it was all over, they presented her with that award. Superintendent of schools came to Poplar, Montana. And all the kids were coming down from the bleachers and shaking her hand and exiting. And I was standing there, and a little boy come up there. And he come up there, and he shook my hand, and he looked at me real seriously. He said, Mr. Bullhead, I thought they were talking about you. So those are the rewards that we teachers get. And that lifted me higher than I could ever imagine. I looked at him and hugged him and I said, thank you. I really appreciate that. A couple of years ago, I was awarded over here at the Crazy Horse Monument Teacher of the Year. And I never thought that would ever happen in my lifetime. Those are beautiful things to be able to be recognized. And so I'm really happy that you are here, and I'm going to share with you a sort of my life as I began as a teacher. Because I never ever thought I'd be a teacher. This is interesting. You know, you, when you're growing up in an alcoholic world, the dysfunctionality, the instability, you know, you get so caught up in it, you don't know what's happening to you. But my father died from an aneurysm. And he was an alcoholic. 
My mother was an alcoholic. My older sister was an alcoholic. My younger brother was an alcoholic. My brother was an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. All my aunties are alcoholics. All my uncle, everybody that I know is an alcoholic. But you know, when you're in that, it's kind of hard to get out of it. I was standing on the street in Fort Yates, and there was a lump behind my head, because my dad died from something similar to that, you know? And so every day I would check it out, and it seemed to be getting bigger and bigger. And I started getting really worried. And I started thinking about how my father passed away. Finally got to a point that was about the size of a marble. So I, um, I went to the clinic. I told the doctor I was scared. And so it was, let's take a look. So he looked into my head. He said, sir, you have nothing to worry about. It. It's only a wood tick. <laughs> so I knew I was in trouble. I better do something about my lifestyle. I better do something. Uh, it was a wood tick. And so I started thinking about what the heck am I doing, you know? So I began. And one thing that I learned, all right, and it took me a long time. I remember my missus picking me up. She was a alcohol program director, one guy, have we ever heard, huh? Her husband standing on the street while she's a director. That's what you call a tuwale or a tuwade right there. And she said, I need your help, Aki. So I fell for it like a tub you know what. And she stopped at her office, I'll be right out, hold baby. So I was holding my little daughter. Must have been hard on her the way I smelled. Then we went up to the clinic and she got some more paperwork. She said, uh, just wait, I'll be right out. So I was holding my little girl. Then she stopped at the police station. She said, this is the last stop. She said, I'll be right out. So she went into the police station. So I'm still sitting outside in the car, thinking nothing. At the Ogallala, kind of. Doors open up and there's a cop on each side. Give me babies. So I gave her, I looked around here, I got these two cops. Hauled me and put me in jail, and I, I said, "Wow, I know my rights, Abkhay." Besides, Uncle Satch is the judge. I said. So I was in there, sobered up for three days. And I went to court. There, Uncle Vernon Standing Crew, my Uncle Satch, he was the judge. I'm out of here. I said, "I got my, I know my rights." After they read my case, he looked at me and I was looking at him. He said, you're going to treatment, he said, and that's it. Don't. <laughs> Ooh, I said, okay, you, know, you don't even hear what I have to say. You're going to treatment. So they sent me to Sergeant's Bluff, Iowa. And you know, on the way down, you know, I got colas all over the place. We stopped in Woolridge and I called him and I said, meet me at the bus depot in Aberdeen. I picked up a, a lid. <laughs> Those of you who know what I'm talking about. Peji. I'm not talking about Peji Hop Hop either. <laughs> so all the way down to, from Aberdeen, I was, <laughs> I was in Utopia. When I pulled into a treatment, I was a happy guy. And it was only why I was so happy. And you know, they recognized that right off the bat. They knew there was something wrong. I wasn't fooling anybody. So I flushed that lid into the toilet because I remember my wife saying, if you want a relationship with your children, you better do something about your problem. And that stayed there. It would always follow me. If you want a relationship with your children, you do something about your problem or don't come around. And I decided I'm going to give this program a try because I've been in treatment centers four times. And what helped it, what did it for me, is uh, my counselors, Lakholi Wagalaka. So, Toha, 
Whenever we saw each other, we spoke to each other in Lakota, and that was for me. Because my first language was Lakota. When I first went to school, you know, my Hukumi Tao, she said, Well, no, we are, it's like Wagalaka, she said. She said, You're starting to talk like a woman, you better go with your uncles and dad to. Itesh now, yeah. I was saying words like, huh, huh? Seriously, too. What's that guy? I was saying. So I went on construction sites. And so my father and them were working on, you know, push cats and caterpillars. And so I'd stayed around the car with my little buffalo bone toys and my little tractor I made out of a spool of thread and soap and a rubber band, you know, yoke I was happy with that world. But I was by the mechanics, you know how they are. Every time they slipped the ranch, they cuss and swear, you know. Anyway, I went to school. And when I went to school, I didn't speak a word of English. And here little Clayton was sitting behind me. And he poked me with a pencil. So I said, Hetcher Schneel. And I'd swing at him. But he kept it up. He poked me again. Hey, Hetcher Schneel. Pretty soon he really poked me. So I swung back and I said, Hetcher Schneel, you S O B Pacha. They sent me home. <laughs> so my first English word I ever used was S-O-B. So when I was in treatment, I began to realize that the only way that I'm going to get out of this lifestyle was to, to study and research. And the only thing that I, could, I had was words, Lakota words. So to this day, I'm still looking for somebody, and I'm offering $20. And I should go higher than that because no one's been able to do it for the last 26 years. But in one English word, equivalent to the Lakota word, achnia. If you can do that, I'll pay you $20. Now I know you, some of you know what that means, right? You know how that is, you grab a little, cute little kid, and, grab their cheeks and squeeze them on, they almost cry, ooh, just a honey, are you? <laughs> well, maybe you're doing that to your honey, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, my presentation here is to, how would you say, give you some ideas on how to incorporate songs in the classroom. And how I do that came about because my little Kakoja. I mean, like I said, they teach you a lot. Choni, she said, Lala, she said, she said, do you know how to sing uh, Itsy Bitsy Spider in Indian? Okay. Indian, I said, there ain't no Indians. I said, I came from some Spanish guy who was lost. <laughs> We're Lakota, I said, Lakota, Dakota. I said, what, well, sing it to me, I said. So, whenever the lights go out, she'd stand by the bed and tell her a ghost story or something, and so she'd sing. Itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout, you know, and I didn't know those songs. I don't know those. I wasn't raised with those kinds of songs, you know. I was raised with Amu, Amu, Enila, Amu. Everyone says, Ishtima. <laughs> so I was raised with songs like that. So anyway, so I started playing around with that song, you know. And I said, well, what else do you do with that song? So she started going, itsy bitsy spine, you know. You, know, you guys know that song, right? And so I started playing around with it. And so I, <clears throat> I started singing the song. I started with Dakota words changed, my Kakojas are, they're Okanas, Dakota. So I say, Iktomi dishkona wakata iadi, ite omakaju, oh no, ampete wehinampre, ite, oh, I forgot the song. Iktomi dishkona wakata iadi, makaju unahe, ite omakaju. Well, she picked it up, you know. 
It's like that. So one day we stopped at her grandpa's house and she said, Okana, I have a song. Oh, I hear a trakoja. She sang the whole song. She reached in the pocket and pulled out a $5 bill and gave it to her. Said, Let's go see Grandma. I said, ah, I thought we jumped in the car. <laughs> Drove to Fort Totten and that, she sang that song and she made about $20 there. So, ah, okay, we're off to Fort Tokyo. Ah, okay. And so I started realizing that this was a way of teaching children using songs telling them stories, keeping them happy in the classroom, all right? And so I tell my students, I said, you do your work today, get that done, and I'll tell you a story, all right? So they get busy, we get done, you know? And so I've told this story 3,000 times, but I usually kind of throw Indian words in there, and kind of mix it up. But there's a little boy that was new to the community, and he wanted to play with the other boys, Kolakiche, he wanted to be friends with them. But they said, hey, uh, if you want to play with us, you got to go where the house with two white eyes lives. The ghost with two white eyes. Oh, I can do that. He said, I'm not scared. <laughs> so they took him to this haunted house, put him in a third story, put him in a closet. He said, you got to stay here till midnight. He said, well, how am I going to know it's midnight? Listen to the church bell. So he was in there, it's pretty soon it got dark. And, Mice and rats running around, you can hear owl hooting and leaves falling. Start getting real spooky, you know, eerie. Owl hooting. All of a sudden they heard somebody. Hey, somebody said. I'm the ghost with two white eyes. Ah da he stood up. Pretty soon it started getting hear the stairs creaking, and pretty soon he's on second floor. Oh, he said, you know, I'm the ghost with two white eyes. Pretty soon, she's doom. Pretty soon the bell went off. Nupa, Yamane, you know, church bell was ringing. All of a sudden, I'm the ghost with two white eyes. He was right outside the door. Pretty soon, Shagaloha, Nepchuanka, Wikjamana, Akewanji. Boom, it hit midnight. Jeez, the hinges from that door came right out. And hear that. Monazi was standing there. He said real loud. That little boy looked up at him and put his fists together. He said, if you don't shut up, you'll be the ghost with two black eyes. <laughs> I don't know how many times those kids want to hear that story, you know. But you put the words in there to teach them how to count. All right? You use the gestures, the sounds, and so you get that prepared and ready for those kids. And they'll work to earn that. And that's how you get those kids to pay attention. Now, when I was in Poplar, Montana, there was a little girl that was dancing for the first time. A little tiny girl, Chepanan, eh? They go tubby cheeks. I had a red kind of felt outfit with jingles on it, really cute little girl. I was sitting there watching. And here her mom walked her out there. Come on, baby, you can do it. And she'd clap her hands like this. Come on, baby, you can do it. And she's really stew, you know. She didn't want to go out there. <laughs> Tiny tots, you know. She got so far, she stood her there now. You can do this, baby, I know you can. But she kept clapping for her. First she started walking away, but she kept clapping and she was coming backwards. The little girl looked back at her and pretty soon, boom, they hit the drum. Started singing. Gee, other kids looked like fleas and crickets and they were, they were dancing, they were going for it. But she looked back at her mom and she seen those kids and she ran back to her mom. Grabbed her mom, she was scared. But she turned around and said, come on baby, I know you can do this. And she kept clapping for her. She got enough sitting right there watching. Pretty soon she looked at her mom, yes, my baby, yes, my baby, you can do it. Pretty soon one leg went, yes, she's doing it, my baby's dancing. Pretty soon the other leg went like this. Pretty soon, hope oh, she's <laughs> ah, there she went round and round and round. And I said, I'm going to make a song out of that, all right? And so I took that and I 
put it as an exercise in the classroom. All right? Now, the thing of it is, is that if you clap over the beat, we have to do it again. So you're going to participate. Okay? So hang in there. Hold on. This drum was given to me when I was in Poplar, Montana. There was a veteran, a Vietnam veteran from Cheyenne River, White Eyes. I got a phone call at the school and said that his family told his family that he wanted me to sing for him when he stepped over. So I was very honored and I came. And after the doings was over, I was presented with this drum. And I thought it was so unique and special because it fits my handprint. I don't know, never met the man, I didn't know him. But he had this given to me. He had it made for me. You know? And if you understand what that handprint means, is that it was a sign of peace. And if you do the research, you'll find out that that was very symbolic when the drums started in our country here, in our land. All right? All right, get your fry bricks together. Keep beat. Here we go. All right, don't be stewing now. Everybody, keep beat here now. Everybody, don't be stew. I see you. Nachmana kaya kishni, grandma. I said. All right, now we're going to go to four beats like this goes. All right, then you kind of soften it up. Manje, nopa, yamane, nopa, and then you pick it up again. All right? All right, that's going to stop. All right, Ooh, awesome. All right, here we go. Now remember, if anybody goes over, we got to do it again. All right? I've done this thing about 20 times over, so here we go. All right, here we go. Keep beat. No kashne na big last guy up here. Hey, hey, hey. No kashne na big last cup here. Hey, hey, hey. No kashne na big last cup here. Hey, hey, hey. All right! Ooh. Bunch of power buffs, I know it. That's the first time that's ever happened. You guys been here before? After the last class, I'm like, hey. So you incorporate that aspect as a physical activity, but they're also picking up the words, all right? All right, so they get to identify with the drum, the heartbeat, the spirit, all right? And they really enjoy that, all right? Now I'm working on some other ones like uh, Hokey Pokey. My intern didn't bring her outfit. We forgot the words, so we couldn't get, get her to participate. But anyway, you know how Hokey Pokey goes, right? Put your crazy in. Yeah. <laughs> Pull your crazy out. Put your crazy in and you chunch all about me. <laughs> you do the hookah hookah na igloo homni. Head chill, head chill, peace. So you do the anatomy. You do the head, the nose, the eyes, the whole thing, you know. All right? And so the kids get to enjoy that. Now, see if you recognize this one. Uh, Recognize that one? You recognize that one? You all know that song, right? Knowing the tune, putting in the Lakota terminology, you're creating a lesson, right? And they will work studiously to get that opportunity to hear you sing, all right? And they love it, you know? They enjoy it, all right? Now, everybody raise your right hand. Point at yourself and say, mie. Yeah. Go like this and say, nie. Yeah. Go like this and say, ie. Yeah. Yeah. Un kie. Yeah. Go like this, un kie pi. Ni e pi. Ni e pi. All right? Now look over that wall over there, and over here. I just wanted to see who had the biggest passu. <laughs> 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 
got to have fun, right? <laughs> All right? Now, go first person singular. Second person singular. Third person singular. You and I. Okay. All of us. All of you. All of them. That's a methodology, a technique that I use to work with my students. And it works. All right? If you tell them in third person singular, it, lo chi means he or she is hungry, then what does lo achi mean? That's right. What does lo yachi mean? Un lo chi. Un lo chi pi. Lo yachi pi. Lo chimpi. It works. You can conjugate verbs, learning nouns, and the whole business using that methodology. But you got to get them to sing it first. You know? So I go through the school system and say, first person singular, second person singular, third person singular, you and I, all of us, all of you, all of them. All right? And so we keep singing that until that's installed and ingrained in their heads. Every once in a while, I'll throw a little bump and grind in there. <laughs> but you got to get them involved, right? And so working with songs and putting them into the, to the school system or students, you know, hey, what is that man doing? That level is too in depth for those kids at that age. I'll say, Duwale. All right? They're going like this to each other all kinds of ways already. So use it, all right? So I walked in a popular school system in here. Whole bunch of kids at the ball game up there. They're running around. You know, kids run around. And so I walked in, and some little kid said, hey, it's Mr. Bullhead, Mr. Bullhead. They're waving. I look at them like this, and I go. She's all quiet down, sat down. Teacher said, how in the heck did you get him to do that? Because I said, all of you, be quiet and sit down. They all sat down. How long they sat, I don't know. But the idea is, all right, the method is there, and so you use it, all right? All right, so now let's pick up another one. If I wanted to go, ooh, ooh, yeah, hua. If I said, Ma hua nahu sleepy. Ni hua. Un hua. Un hua pe. All of us, right? Ni hua pe. Hua pe. All of them are sleepy. So they say, I bet I can get you to talk Indian. They say, how? Well, this is how. It's a methodology, right? <laughs> you get them to use the methodology. And you back it up with songs. All right? Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Iktomi. All right? The trickster, the shyster, the con artist. And we're all capable of being like that. I know I was. I used to make all kinds of excuses to go to the power. Boy, what are you saying? You don't love me no more? <laughs> Whenever are you going to wax these floors? Always dirty. Blue Transica, I'd get her mad. She said, get the hell out of here. I'm off, man. Drumsticks, all pre-packed. Are you gathering? She's gone. All right? I've been there. I've done that. You know? So over the years, the one thing that I gave up, and somebody said, well, my cousin, she said, your missus is here. Oh, geez, I got nervous. She knows me better. I know myself. So I never argue with her. I have learned that as a man. I learned that in treatment. Because one time my mom said, don't argue. Turn around, walk away. I'll never forget that. I had long hair. I started walking away. Paycheck was right here. Had a few beers. Ah, all I seen was the moon next. Ah, she had her hands in my long hair and she had me done. Ah. So I've learned not to argue with my missus anymore. She's in control. Whatever she says goes. And we've been together 30 some years now. Before that, I used to eat you pa her. Used to just, you know. It doesn't work. 
So that advice that I got from my parents works good. And your mother-in-law. Hea, 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 man. Whatever she says, you just talk to another person. Send her away. That works too. You know, she does all the talking. I just walk away. It works. And we've been told that generation to generation. And it works. All right? Now, when I talk to the kids, share songs with them, all right, the one thing that I always, always say to my kids, you're a teacher. You go home and you teach that to your brothers and sisters. You teach that to your grandpa and grandmas, all right? And so a little boy, 48, he went home and he told his grandma, he said, Uchi, he said, Mazas kama niche yelo. That means, I need some money. Because I said, don't demand money. Tell them you need money. So, Uchi, Mazas kama niche yelo. Well, what we didn't know, when he came back to school, he was really feeling bad. He was down. I said, what's wrong? What happened? He said, Mr. Bullhead, I told my grandma I need some money. And she really got mad at me. <laughs> well, what we didn't know is that her mother just got an insurance for a hundred and some thousand dollars. So her grandma said, why are you asking me? Go ask your mother. <laughs> so sometimes you got to be careful what you have to say. So over the years, the 30 years, right, that I've been working with children, the main obstacle that I ran across is attention span. As sad as it may be, it's out there. We have kids who don't have no attention spans. And the law says you've got to work with them and you've got to teach them. And so when I went to work, they had all the special ed children in one room. From 7th grade, 8th grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, all of them on room. They had a room for all of them. And so when I went into that classroom, I didn't know anything about Redlin. I didn't know how it works, so everybody used it. Anyway, there was a boy in that classroom. His name was Cubby. He was about 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, freshman. Great big guy, you know. Cubby, his name was. Anyway, I'm trying to work with him and conjugate some verbs on a board. You know, I've got to get started. All of a sudden, a book hits the board. Boom. Jeez, I turned around. That big, I'm going home. He said, jeez, he stood up. Hey, Uncle Cubby, I said, I don't think you can go home. I started walking. I was going to try to calm him down. When I reached for him and got close, he backed up. Ow, he said. Jeez, I didn't even touch him, man, you know. The law came in, you know. Didn't touch him. So he went out, went to the door, and he slammed it, almost broke that side window. Then I got mad. Jeez, I was going to take after him. I got to the door, and I could sense somebody watching me. I could feel eyes on me. I turned around here, the rest of the kids are all sitting there watching, what is he going to do? You know? So I turned around, and I got through that class period. As soon as that bell rang, I went down and told the principal, and I said, I'm not going to be able to do this. I have no training in this. I have never, ever worked in this area before. I'm not going to be able to handle this. I mean, this is the first day of school. Earl, he said, when you sign that contract, it states that you're going to give them instruction as part of your job. You know? So I was going to quit because I know I ain't going to be able to handle these kids. No way, man. I said, what am I going to do? So that weekend I went home. I sat there all weekend long. I was thinking, what am I going to do? I don't want to uh, just resign and maybe go back to school, do something else. Why? I'm quitting. I ain't going to do it. So I decided Monday I'm going to go in and resign and that's going to be it. I can't handle him. So I sat down, took my hand drum out, and I started singing songs, you know, just playing around with the drum, just making, playing around with tunes, you know, singing old songs, just, you know. All of a sudden it dawned on me, why don't I teach him how to make a drum? Why don't I teach him how to make a drumstick in Ijabu? Why don't I teach him how to put up little teepees? Why don't I teach him how to make star quills? You know, I can do that, all right? And I've been a teacher ever since. So sometimes, you know, it's right there in front of you. You just have to kind of look at it and examine it and see what you can do for the kids. 
So in my lifetime, I've had to memorize a lot of stories. Lots of stories, all right? Now, you know who Iktomi is, right? Kotko, okay, man. You can't beat him. Don't even try. He's, he's Kili. Iktomi was walking like that. And I thought he was walking like that. And you know, the word is kakena, they say. You know, you see young kids walking like this, you know, today. But Iktomi was walking like that. Who knows? Long time ago. You know, uh, cool, man, he's walking. <laughs> Kakena, they say. He's, oh, that time he's walking. Yeah. Now you see young kids walking like that. The only difference is Uzoga, Uzula, the crotch is down here. <laughs> Meaning something, you know. They're coming. He told me he was walking like that a long time ago. All of you sir, heard the singing. Someone was really singing. Jeez, he looked around. The window was kind of shifty. He kind of couldn't tell where it was coming from. The only good thing he could see was this great big skull out there in a flat, Obalayel, out in the prairie. He looked over there and he started walking over there and he started getting louder. He went down and oh, somebody's really singing in there. So he put his eyeball where there used to be an eyeball. And here's a little mice really getting down. Yeah, I thought, that's a... <laughs> he told me his foot pretty soon has got going like this. He has a good song, you know. He was looking at... Mija, 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 he was hollering. <laughs> me too, me too, me too, he was saying. So the guy looked up, saw him. Hello, he said, you know. All he seen was a big eyeball. He really getting down in there. Hello, hello, he said. He said, how am I going to get in there, you know. He said, how am I going to get in there, you know. So he went in the back and he took that dirt. And there's a word they say, pump, huh. It's brittle. It's real soft. What is that? Oh, hi, he said. So he got on his knees. Put his head there and he started kind of wiggling his head and he peeked his face in there. And you heard they seen him. He said he's going to make mischief. It's Iktomi. Everybody took off. And all the mice took off. He stood up. He said, gee, they come falling out of there. Grass come falling out. And you know, a skull was on his head. He kept shaking that head like that. He said, and here it echoed. He kind of liked that, you know? Hookah, he said. Hookah, hookah, hookah. See, you know. <laughs> ho, 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 ho. So he's walking around in prayer looking at him. Do ho, do ho, do ho. He's walking around amusing himself. <laughs> when I got tired of that, so when I he tried to take it off and the hair wouldn't come off. Hokish, he said. You know? Pretty soon. Oh, Pretty soon somebody walked by. Hey, Tahashi, he said, Tonik, Shatokahor, he said. Oh, He's pushing it all, twisting it, shaking it. Hey, he said, Tahashi, he said. Iukta, he said. Oh, Iyo, Tonka, Kpai, Ktaina, he said. Abha, he said, Kabalachik, he said. Oh, he said, Ah, he got over to the boulder and he looked at it. Well, oh, he said, Abha, Abha. He said, put it. He measured it and he put his head on there. He hit it. He caught Jake to get it. Didn't work. Somebody else came, I want to talk to the bike. He said, hey, I'm going to talk to the bike. I'm going to talk to the bike. He said, He said, He Okay, he measured it this time. He said, Couldn't break it. Pretty soon here comes the chief, you know. Already, he said. So after he went over to that boulder, he put his measure down it, and ah, the unzit guy. 
He look over, ho, ho, you go. Out the one I was standing way over that boulder, it was way over there. But that time there's a big crowd that came. All the women, men would say, hook a hey. All the women would say, ho wanna. What are you saying? They're chanting for him. Hook a hey, ho wanna. Pretty soon. Ah, he's getting psyched up. He's going. He's getting ready. Ah, I put his head down. Jeez, he took off. Holy, he's really going. He hit that bowler out there. Smashed his head off all over the place. Jeez, a bunch of dust. I can't let you say energy. Jeez, he went all running over there. Look at Ah, don't need to try. Are you all right? He said, I talk to you. all right? He said, He said, I talked to you. He said, He threw up all over them. <laughs> so, your children, when you're out in the playground and somebody hits their head and they start getting sick, what are you going to do? They say, What? Well, tell the principal? Yes. Tell the teacher? Yes. Because what happened to Iktomi? He started hemorrhaging in the brain. And when that happens, you get sick. So if you see somebody fall from the swing, fall from the slide, or get hit in the head, you get them help right away. Can you do that for me? Yes, yes, yes. So you've incorporated a story, a lesson that the children can use. And you've amused them, and you have them. 30 years I've been doing it. It works. Now, I didn't do this last time, but is there any questions about any other aspects of how you can incorporate a song into the, to the school? All right. Go like this. Put your forehead on your forearms. Everybody. Now, I'm not going to come over and thump you on the forehead. Trust me, some of you are looking at me right now. <laughs> Put your forearms on the table. Foreheads on your forearms. All right. All right. Now relax. This is a song I was raised with. Amu, amu. Hey, Stima. Amu. Ishtima. Ishtima. Amu, amu, inila, amu. You know where we got that song from? Hey, kick tampo, don't fall asleep on me. That's just like, <laughs> ah, the whole, it must be a long day. <laughs> Somebody's snoring back there. One of the coonshies was snoring back there. I was told by a lady who, was, who has gone on now, but she told me, she said, honey, there's a, how they used to travel in the Travois, and there was a young girl. She had a small baby, but <clears throat> she was busy talking all the time, visiting. And every once in a while, she'd look back and check on the baby, and the baby was tied to the Travois. And so as they were traveling like that, the whole tribe was moving. She kept talking, she kept visiting, and she spent less time checking on the baby. And she got so busy talking, there was a period of time where she didn't check on the baby. And so they had gone through some tall grass, and they had gone. And finally she realized it, and she looked back, and there was no baby on the travois. And so they had to stop the whole tribe. The whole caravan had to stop. In them days, you didn't do that, because it was important that they kept moving. And so what they did is they assigned an elderly man, an old scout, to go back and look for the Hokshichala, you know, the little baby. Now that little baby, Hokshichala, is what my boy named the little unborn, Hokshichala. So that grave marker has Hokshichala bullhead on it. And so they went, he went looking for that little baby. It was getting dark. He didn't know what to do because 
couldn't find it. And so he was standing there wondering what he was going to do. And that's when he heard that tune. Amu, Amu. So he started listening to where that sound was coming from. And he was listening carefully and pretty soon he started getting the direction where it was coming from. So he started walking slowly towards it. And it was just over a hill. So he went down on his knees and he crawled over and he peeked over the top. And all he could see was a porcupine. But that's where that song was coming from. So he was watching like that. He said, that's impossible, he said. You know? But that song kept playing. He kept singing it. So he looked over like that, and here that porcupine moved over, and there was that little baby. And that's where that song came from. And that's the stories I tell and I share with my children in the classroom. And I sing the song for them. So I hope you're all relaxed. Because it develops a rapport with your students that they're never going to forget. And so when that little boy said, Mr. Bullhead, I thought they were talking about you. I'll take with me for the rest of my life. Now, I don't know how much time we got left, but time flies when you're having fun. About 10 minutes. Okay, any questions? <clears throat> eh? Now, I speak Lakota, I work on Dakota, I'm working on Nakota, and I'm living in Lower Bro, I speak the word language. My wife called me, she said, uh, you getting paid Friday? I said, word? <laughs> you think you can wire me some money? Word, I said. <laughs> Get it here by four o'clock, word, I said. <laughs> How do you know when somebody honks their horn that they're from Lower Bro? Because the horn goes, Wah. that's what they say down there. We're Jake's, we're John, everything's we're. So I'm in the habit of saying it now. We're. Questions? We're. we're. <laughs> it's catching on. Eh? How many believe the word snag is an Indian Lakota started at first? Yeah. Now you hear it in the movies. Nag. Okay, if not, I got 10 minutes that I have to kill here, so. But the only thing I can share with you now is <clears throat> when they say walking the red road, all right? The last person I spoke to was B Medicine, and I told her, I said, you know what? I said, I'm doing a presentation called Walking the Red Road. She said, it's a mechanical device but it also has an aspect of philosophy to it. And a lot of us work with that circle. We see it on dance outfits. We see it called them medicine wheels. But in Lakota, we call it chankugleshka. And so I translate that as the road of many colors. And so when it comes to walking the red road, it's not an easy thing. You have to find that balance. They call it yin and yang. I didn't understand that for many years. Because when doing something's doing something positive, there's something good going on. You kind of think about it and it gets a little negative. Well, you have to reach over there and try to understand that. Try to see what that's all about. And when something negative is going on, and you think of it from positive, you have to balance that. You have to go and figure that out. You research it, try to understand that situation. And so what you're doing is you're balancing it. You're going and be tolerant from this way to that way till you find that balance of understanding. And when you do that, you become an associated to knowledge and wisdom. You know, I was scared to become old. Anybody like that? Ah, Tawana, I stayed 39 years old for six years. <laughs> How old are you now, Earl? 39. They said, really? I said, yeah. Yeah. I, say. I stayed like that for six years. I didn't want to become old. I didn't want to have gray hair. You know? I didn't want to get old. But when I started studying that wheel, the terminology, the hokshichala, the baby, the hokshila, the boy, we chinchala, koshkalaka, 
we coach Galaka, young women, young men, and we chasha and we are. It came to we chachchala and we nuchchala. So I took that word and I said, he takcha chabe, we nuchchala, or we chachchala. What does that mean? And Lala Joe said, chichchala, that means a flower. So we chachchala means you're blossoming. So takuku hena ya nigi hena when you get old, you can share that with your kids because now you have experience. You're blossoming in wisdom. You're an elder now. You can share those things. And when I learned that, when well, I'm 60 years old. <laughs> yeah, I get to eat at special rates. I had my birthday dinner in Pier at the country kitchen. You know, she was all coming in. We choked up, so I was sitting there. And I had that waitress come up. I said, is there a special rate for elderly here? They said, yes. I said, how old do you have to be? 60. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, do you get a discount? She said, yes. I'll mark it on your ticket. So I was all smiles. I went up and I paid for my ticket and here they gave me a 68 cent discount. Well, yeah. <laughs> I should have celebrated down at the casino. <laughs> so you get at that age, that understanding of what chala means, all right? Then you become wise. You become old. You're getting ready. You know, when people, this is the honest to God truth. I right? just say, God, tonkash truth. Tonkashila, tonkawakanishila. How you interpret that? But I was in boarding school in Pierce, South Dakota. People say, I saw the light. I was swimming. They had water pipes along the edge. And here was a young girl, a Kota girl, sitting in the corner. You know, and at that age, I'm shrew, you know. I don't want to go by her legs. So I decided to diagonally go in front of her. But it was deeper there, above my head. So I decided I can make it. So I pushed off, and I started swimming. And I looked up, and I saw her like this, and then I... Decided to stand up, and here there was no bottom. I went under. And I was screaming for help. Bubbles coming out. She's looking at me, smiling. She thought I was showing off. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a hiss in my ears. A real small hiss. It's real slight. It goes, you know, like shh. And I'm all of a sudden, I can hear all that fear. All right? started dissipating, no longer struggling for air. It started dissipating. And I listened to that sound. And all of a sudden, I felt tranquility. And I wasn't afraid. I wasn't scared. There was peace there. And I just relaxed. And there I was. All right? I'll come to it, and some woman had me, revived me. I was just coughing up water and everything like that. She revived me. To this day, I don't know who she was, but she saved my life. All right? And she said, young man, she said, you stay in the two feet part. <laughs> and so I've been there. <laughs> One more song? Now. I'm trying to remember the words in that song. It's kind of a tough one. I've been asked many times, and one of the most difficult things that I've have encountered was having to sing for young people who committed suicide. His father approached me followed me up to a Grand River Casino. I was going to go eat. The car was following me. And I parked. He pulled in beside me. Here's one of my singing buddies. And he had a 12-pack of beer. And he had a beer in between his legs. And it wasn't open. And I went up to him and I says, Toka, Earl, he said, I'm having a hard time. He said, I don't know what to do. His young son and his girlfriend his girlfriend was pregnant. She 
committed suicide. They made a pact, a written pact. He followed her two weeks later. And so the father is asking me to help them and make a song for their family. Now, I was reluctant because I was raised that suicide was not right amongst our people. That's no, no. We don't do that. That is the that is foolish way. And so we were raised that way. So I'm thinking, geez, you know. And so he handed me tobacco. I mean, with a beer can, six pack. He handed me tobacco. And so when I took that tobacco, I made a commitment. So the next day, I called his wife. And I said, you know, I said, your husband approached me with tobacco. And I didn't tell him about the drinking or if he was even drinking. I didn't make that judgment. I just seen it. And she said, Earl, she said, he's having a hard time. He doesn't know what to do. And so I decided right there that I was going to go ahead and honor that request because he gave me tobacco. And so I start piecing that song together. And at the Cannonball Celebration that summer, they had their doings. And they asked me to sing that song. And so I'm going to share that with you. And I hope that you listen to the words and you find comfort in it. It goes like this. thank all of you for coming and the announcement before I forget these words in these packets when I put out walking the red road there was something about that event there's a song in there called your children are your child is coming home and it's used and sung in the radio for memorials more than I'd ever imagined but I did it for my children's grandfather. And so when it came time to record that song, I said, well, maybe somebody will get, find comfort from a song like this. All right? And so I recorded it. And so I hope that those of you who listen to Keeley and Keeney, I guess they play those a lot, but we don't get that radio station over there, so we don't get to, to hear much of it. But I kept this. So there's nobody else has these words into this song. But there are also song texts. So if you're interested in having it, you know, I had these printed this morning and it cost me some bucks. So I got to make it up. So if you want to keep these, all right, you can uh, pay her $10 and you can have them. That's up to you. If not, well, we'll just pick them up. I can use them again someplace. But, and if you want me to autograph it, it's going to require a hug. All right, thank you for coming.